I have an ideal south facing and sloped roof. So how come I don't have solar panels on it? I've always loved the idea of rooftop solar panels. I think it's really cool and it's, I mean, your roof is going to get sun anyway, so you may as well convert it into energy. Uh, it can decrease the amount of energy that you need from the grid. It also shades your roof, which can keep it cooler during the summer. Um, you know, maybe it can decrease uh, the amount of energy that utilities have to create using other types of fuels. And you also have your own personal power generator, um, you know, if the electricity is off. So there's all kinds of benefits and stuff. So back in 2014, I had a local company give me an estimate and the size of the system that they quoted, actually it was two different sizes, but the one that made the most sense at the time was a 2.5 kilowatt system. And the quote for that installed and everything was uh, $5,700, uh, including the 30% tax uh, rebate that's available for those kinds of systems. So of course, one of the first things to do is to uh, calculate how much energy this thing is going to create and how long it's going to take to pay for itself, how much money it's going to save me per year, all that kind of stuff. So there's a couple ways to do this. Um, at the time, the person that did the estimate um, said that solar systems generally in this area get about the equivalent of 13% of uh, the year's total hours. Now there's 8,760 hours in a year, so what that means is that the uh, solar system in my area would generate the equivalent of um, max output for 13% of those hours. 13% of 8,760 is 1,138 hours of max output. So then you multiply that by the size of the system, 2.5 kilowatts, and we get about 2,850 uh, kilowatt hours produced per year. So there's one estimate. Another estimate is uh, using a site that Google has set up called Project Sunroof. And if you go to their site, you can just uh, put in your address. And if it's an area that's been analyzed, uh, Google will show you uh, how much energy they calculate that your roof will, um, will receive and how much energy generation you can make. Uh, there's a little slider there so you can adjust like what's your monthly bill and then it'll tell you like how big of a system you probably need to put in how much square footage is available on your roof for solar panels, all kinds of cool information. So if I use that estimate, Google says that I will receive about uh, 1,369 hours of usable sunlight. So multiply that times the size of my system, which is 2.5, and I get about 3,420 uh, kilowatt hours per year. So that's another way to estimate it. But what's probably the most uh, accurate way to do it is to compare it to data from an actual solar system in the area. This is a solar park just outside of where I live. This is three megawatts of solar panels and this is run by our local utility, Consumers Energy. This site is paired with another site which is uh, one megawatts for a total of four megawatts of solar power. And all the energy production data is actually publicly available online. If you search for Consumers Energy uh, Solar Gardens, uh, you can come up to this uh, web, web page and it'll show you the daily, hourly, and yearly totals. Together, uh, these solar panels produce about 6,000 megawatt hours per year, which if you put that in terms of their peak production, that's about 1,500 hours, 1,500 hours of peak production from these solar panels over the course of a year. 1,500 hours of uh, peak production is about 17% of the total uh, time in a year that this solar park actually generates. Now using the online data, I calculated that it produces the uh, equivalent of 1,500 hours of electricity per hour. So if we use that number, then I'm getting about 3,750 kilowatt hours per year from a 2.5 uh, kilowatt system. And the advantage um, of using that data to calculate what my roof would do is that um, that solar system is a real solar system and it's actually operating in this area with the same weather patterns, the same uh, snow cover, uh, the same, you know, cloud cover, the same loss of sunlight during the winter, um, you know, due to the rotation of the earth and all that kind of stuff. All that's built into the data um, of that solar system. There are a few differences. Uh, for example, my house has a ch tall chimney on one side, 
on the uh, western side and then it's got trees on the eastern side and both of those produce a little bit shade uh, in the morning and evening so that would cut some time out of um, my solar system production um, and that's not there in the utility scale one it's basically in a field so they don't really have shade but uh, they don't remove the snow during the winter um, from that. They just let it melt off, which it does once the sun comes out for a little while. That wouldn't be the case with mine. Uh, I would probably be cleaning the snow off of mine, um, you know, as the snow comes, like either on a daily or a weekly basis or something. So mine might produce uh, a little higher percentage during the winter. But either way, uh, these are three different systems and at least gives you um, a reasonable range of expected production uh, for a solar system. So comparing all those estimates, uh, based on my electricity rate, which is about um, 15 cents per kilowatt hour once you include distribution fees, taxes, uh, all that kind of stuff. So at the lower end, I would be uh, offsetting about $415 worth of electricity per year. And at the high end of the estimates, it would be offsetting $560 per year. So I'm going to use the higher amount just to calculate things as a best case scenario. So using that higher amount, since the system would cost about uh, $5,700, um, in 10 years it would save me uh, $5,600, uh, which is about the same. So it basically has, it'll pay for itself in 10 years. And then I'm kind of comparing this to other 15-year investments. Uh, so if you extend that out to uh, 15 years, the total amount of savings would be $8,430 after uh, the initial investment of $5,700. So that's how I went about calculating the dollars and cents of the system, but there's other benefits to having a solar system on your roof as well, or on your property, it doesn't have to be on your roof. Uh, but one of those is grid independence. So if the grid goes down uh, for some reason, uh, whether for, I don't know, weather or they just need to do maintenance, um, you have your own energy producing apparatus. The, this is kind of hit or miss though, and um, first of all, it wouldn't help us in our area all that much because our power almost never goes out. Uh, most of our lines are underground and it's just pretty reliable. Um, so that's, that's not a big motivating factor. Um, but even if it was, it's a little bit tricky because um, solar systems are often hooked up so that they feed directly into the grid and then you get credited for the electricity. But when the grid is down, uh, that means that they're probably going to be doing work, so the inverters are designed so that uh, no electricity is allowed to go into the uh, grid um, while it's down, because otherwise you have electricity being fed into it and, you know, the workers who are doing maintenance are going to get fried by that electricity. So the whole thing shuts down, uh, so you're not actually generating usable electricity for your house even though you have the system. So it's, it's pretty complicated and to be honest, I, I don't know how it it would be um, allowed to be set up here because obviously you can have battery storage systems that will power your house under outages. So um, anyway, that was kind of a complicated issue and it wasn't one that would motivate um, me to going through all the trouble of having this uh, put on. Now another ideal benefit that is non-monetary is uh, a reduction in emissions at the utility level. So the theory is if, I, if I'm producing electricity that uh, cancels out my usage, then the utilities don't have to produce as much uh, so we use less fuel and there's less emissions. Um, but is that really the case? Um, if I put a solar system on my roof, um, are they really going to turn down the amount of fuel that they burn? Probably not, because I don't think they do that now when I'm on vacation for like a week or two or something like that. So it, the, the amount that we use uh, on an individual housing basis is so tiny compared to the amount that they have to generate on a daily basis. So all this trouble that I'm going it, going to, like, is it really going to have an impact in that way? Probably not directly. Now, of course, you can argue if everybody does it or if, you know, lots of people do it, then it's going to have a noticeable um, decrease. And that is true. Um, but on an individual basis, like, is my solar system making an impact in terms of utility scale emissions? Probably not. Now another non-monetary benefit that is indirectly related to emissions is demand curve leveling. So if you graph out like how much energy is uh, required at different times of the day, you get a demand curve. So sometimes, you know, a city requires very little uh, energy. Usually the least amount of energy is required around like between 4 to 6 a.m. in the morning. 
um, and then up here it peaks uh, at uh, around 6 o'clock in the evening, 6 p.m. So the utility companies have to have the necessary equipment to produce enough electricity to meet the um, times of highest demand during the day, uh, such as on a um, summer afternoon where everybody's uh, air conditioners are running or something like that. But when the demand goes down, then they have all kinds of equipment that is basically useless. Um, it still costs money to, for upkeep to make sure it can actually run, but it's not actually generating any revenue. But they have to have it because they have to be able to meet the peak. Well, this relates to solar because um, let's say this is 6 p.m. and this is 6 a.m. So somewhere, I don't know, in here, in this window, somewhere in there, would be when the sun is out and solar systems are actually creating um, electricity. So they would actually be able to level this out. In other words, they would produce more electricity when during the peak times. Um, and then, of course, it's not producing electricity at night. Um, but this would allow, uh, at least if it was scaled up, it would allow utility companies uh, to maintain less other equipment to address um, the peak times. Um, and those, that equipment is called peak generators. So what if a huge portion of the population puts in solar panels? Uh, so this is another thing I was considering. Um, Elon Musk himself had said that uh, the, the way the grid operates now, uh, it would be able to sustain a penetration of solar rooftop of about 20% of the population. In other words, if 20% of people um, all had rooftop solar systems, it would, that energy generation would be able to be incorporated into the grid and be beneficial in the way that uh, power grids are currently um, managed. Uh, let's say like 80% of uh, the population in this area puts in solar panels. So that means that they will be uh, buying very little electricity during the day, uh, which you think, okay, that's great. That means uh, you need less infrastructure, you know, you, need, you use less fuel, um, and all that has to happen is the utility provides the rest of the electricity. Well, that's pretty tricky because, because it has the potential to actually destabilize the way things are set up because uh, first of all, that's a loss of revenue for uh, the utility. But then, um, at some point, the sun's not going to be shining, so and they still have a large demand for electricity that needs to be met. So the utility has to meet that um, demand, which means that it has to maintain its infrastructure and power plants and all that kind of stuff for those times when the sun isn't shining, but it's not actually getting any revenue during the day or le a lot less revenue um, to actually cover all those costs. And I know this is a huge oversim oversimplification. Um, the, the power structure is very complicated because of its massive scale and also because it's uh, basically a government approved uh, monopoly. But the point is, if you're trying to find things uh, to do on a personal level that can accelerate the transition to a uh, different kind of energy production, uh, you kind of have to think about these things in terms of what if everybody or a ton of people all did the same thing, what effect would that have? Now, ideally, of course, it would be great if the utility companies were developing their own uh, massive solar farms or solar fields, basically, and incorporating that um, automatically into their grid logistics. Um, but that hasn't really been the case for a variety of reasons, and those reasons aren't, you know, that's not what this video is about. This video is about, um, you know, the thinking process that I went through in determining whether or not to put in a solar system at the time. Now, what I'm describing is a situation where lots and lots of people have solar, and that's actually not the case in Michigan, um, probably mostly because we don't actually get that much sun. We get like 90 days of full sun out of a year. So anyway, all that to say, the penetrance here of um, rooftop solar is less. So oversaturating the market with solar panels is not, you know, it's not a huge consideration in the grand scheme of things, at least for this region. Now, bringing it back to the original point of this video, uh, how did I invest in solar or why don't I have solar panels on my roof? So at the time, back in 2014, um, Solar City was offering a uh, investment option. They had, they were offering uh, uninsured bonds, which sounds risky, right? Uh, for up to 15 years and up to uh, five and three quarters percent, 5.75 percent interest. 
Um, so I calculated that out. Uh, if I if I put the five grand into a bond instead of a solar system, the 15 year uh, total value would be about eleven thousand five hundred dollars uh, at compound interest. So that's a fair amount higher than the eight thousand four hundred and thirty dollars that I had calculated using the uh, most optimal estimate uh, that I could of solar generation. Um, so that's what I did. I ended up uh, buying a Solar City bond that was, um, I think it was 5,000. When I was uh, just sort of doing groundwork for this video, I realized that actually that bond interest is not compound. Uh, it's actually simple interest. Um, so the value at the end of 15 years is actually, it's a little over $9,000. So it's still actually a little bit more than what I calculated the solar system to be, um, but not quite as much. But investing with Solar City also does have some other non-monetary uh, benefits, such as it's uh, a direct investment into a company that's making solar uh, not just widespread, but also uh, much more affordable and um, sort of advancing that technology in a very practical and global scale, which for some of the reasons that I just discussed, you know, just myself putting a, a system on my house wouldn't necessarily um, promote. Not that that's a bad thing. I still might put a solar system on. I'm not sure. Um, at the time, solar city, solar city was not servicing Michigan, and I don't believe Tesla is either. Um, now that they've taken over Solar City, um, but once they do, uh, I definitely want to check out their options and uh, see what they offer, see what their pricing is, especially now that um, solar panels um, they've continued to decrease in price even since 2014. Uh, although I don't think not quite as drastically as uh, before then. Um, but anyway, that's to be determined. Uh, I might still put a small system up just because it's it's really cool. Um, and it'd be really neat to harvest the sunlight that's blasting my roof in the summer and heating up the house. If you are interested in putting a Tesla solar system on, uh, if you use my referral code for that, for that job, which I'll have uh, down in the description, uh, you'll get an extra five years uh, on the warranty of that uh, solar product for free. And also, if, of course, if you're looking to uh, buy a Model S or a Model X, you can use my referral code uh, for that uh, and to receive uh, free unlimited supercharging. And that offer is set to expire January 31st of 2018. So any Tesla purchased after that time, January 31st, um, will not receive free unlimited supercharging. So yeah, there it is. Um, I hope this video was helpful. If not helpful, then at least interesting. Um, I'd love to hear your comments, uh, questions, suggestions, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.